Guys and gals, welcome back to the show. My name is Luke. This is the Outdoor Gear Review. In this episode of After the Camp, I am discussing the nature hike, budget-friendly ice storm adventure that I recently went on. With that adventure, there's a lot to discuss, including gear, food, the area, weather, and more. For this video, I highly recommend a cup of coffee, and I hope you don't mind if I take a look here at my notes. There's a lot to go over here. This will keep me on track. So to start off with this, I was in the Pisgah National Forest area outside of the Roseboro area. The Roseboro area is a small community. It used to be a thriving like logging town sort of thing, but for the most part, it has faded away. So I was outside of that area. I've talked about that area in previous adventures. The part of the Pisgah Forest that I was in is a very remote area. And there are some things to keep in mind when you're going that far out into the middle of nowhere. Cell phone service was very spotty. In fact, my phone didn't work most of the time. There is something that we need to talk about when it comes to being in remote areas, such as the Pisgah National Forest. Oftentimes you will find a seedier aspect out there. During the day, it's not that bad, but at nighttime, you do have to be cautious. For myself, I tend to stay close to my vehicle when that far out, and that includes like the Linville Gorge area, the Roseboro area, and so on. You really do have to be careful. You have to be diligent. This ties into the incredible amount of garbage that I found on this trip. As you saw in the adventure, I was hiking through the forest, came across a campsite, that had been absolutely trashed. There was just garbage everywhere. There were trees chopped down. That is a very common theme. You will see this a lot when you go out into remote areas that are accessible by vehicle. When you're out in such areas, there is increased freedom for people to do whatever they want to. So oftentimes you will find roads that are torn up. You will find that every sign or gate has been shot full of holes. Trees are chopped down. You'll find garbage everywhere. You also have to be careful about drugs, meth, people making meth in the woods and so on. It's out there, it's real. Again, talking about your vehicle, if you're parking at a trailhead overnight, you do have to be careful. Vehicle break-ins over the last year is up like 80 something percent. Vehicles that are off-road specific that have been really decked out, those are targets. Of course, very nice vehicles that are going to be targets. Unfortunately, this is just an aspect to remote areas that you have to keep in mind. There's that element. They see that, they see those components, they know the value, and that is when someone who has spent all of that money becomes a target. And it's because of that, I wasn't that far from my vehicle with this trip. All in all, the loop that I came up with was 3.5 miles long, and it was a good little trip. It really was. I like that area. There's a lot to do there. There's numerous wilderness areas that you can explore. I started on an old logging road, went into a wilderness area, went off trail into the woods, looped around to another campsite that I've been at, hiked the road a little bit, went into the woods, and that's when I came across the campsite that was completely trashed. There was the tent, there were sleeping bags, there were chairs, there was a hatchet, there was food, there was a coffee press, there was dry bags. The individuals that stayed there, they basically trashed everything, they chopped down a bunch of trees, and they left all of their garbage behind. I wasn't able to clean up the garbage while I was there. I didn't have enough space inside of my pack and it was too remote, but Susan and I, we did return a few days later and we cleaned that place up. We got rid of everything. We also stopped at other campsites along the way and we ended up leaving the area with four bags of trash. So yes, we helped make the area beautiful again for now. The road out there is absolutely trashed. I've been out there doing some filming, doing some testing at nighttime vehicles come through and they're tearing the road up on purpose. They're flying around the corner, just digging ruts, and simply it's an aspect to being in a remote area. While there are many trails, many backpacking opportunities, you do have to keep the safety of your vehicle in mind. Something else that you have to think about when it comes to remote areas is violence. With the Pisgah National Forest being an example, you could talk about like the Linville area with the Linville Gorge. Countless murders have taken place there. A few years ago, somebody was decapitated. At some point in time, I'm not even sure how many years it was back, some guy went through a campsite and killed a couple people, something like that. Again, you're in a remote area, violence happens, there's crazy people out there, there's people who just wanna do bad things. That's how it works. You need to be prepared to take care of yourself because you are way out in the middle of nowhere. The odds are you will not see a park ranger or any sort of law enforcement. With this trip, let's talk about the weather for a second. That was supposed to be a snowstorm. I think the original forecast was like four or five inches of snow. That was completely incorrect. It started off as freezing rain and it absolutely poured all night long 
into the morning. As soon as I got to the truck and basically headed out, that's when the storm was over. Even though <laughs> the original forecast was for the storm to last all day long into the next day. That is a great example as to why you need to take a look at the forecasts, but don't trust them. Don't rely on them. You need to make sure that you have all the gear with you to handle any sort of event. And in this case, I was fully prepared. The temperature was so close to freezing that I knew that it could go either which way. I had this feeling that it could be freezing rain or it could be snow. So I had prepared. I was hoping for the best, planning for the worst, and I was okay with this trip. By morning, there was a very impressive amount of ice in the area. The entire campsite, the forest, just coated in ice. All of the trees were just bent over. It was incredibly beautiful. And at the same time, it was very exciting because as soon as I got up, I started getting dressed, getting everything packed up, a thunderstorm hit the area. So it was a thunderstorm ice storm and it was rocking. It was, it was super exciting. I had a blast and it made the entire event very special for me. Folks, it is a thunderstorm out there. Woo! Rock and roll, man, let's do this. <laughs> I love it. You all know how much I love terrible weather conditions and this was just awful, it really was. Luckily, it wasn't that cold. The air temperature was right at 32 degrees, but the ground temperature was just a little bit warmer. So in the end, I did not have many problems getting out of the area. Driving out of the area wasn't that big of a deal. There were some down trees, some down limbs, all of which I could just go around. The road did get slick towards the top and that's right around 3,800 feet, but luckily powered through it, got out nice and safe, hit the road and the road was good. Getting out of the area and out of that ice storm was very important. You don't mess with ice. Ice is something that can absolutely devastate a forest. So you have to worry about falling limbs and falling trees. You don't want to play around with that sort of stuff. And that's something that you have to keep in mind for any adventure that you go out on. You have to know when to make the call to head out. It's like Susan and I's previous winter adventure there at Mount Rogers. Over one foot of snow fell within roughly 12 hours. We had to make the call to either stay up there and battle all of that snow or to leave. Well, the right decision was to leave the mountain. And with this case, with this adventure, the right decision was to leave the area. Leave the area before the ice got too thick, the weather was unpredictable. You always have to keep that in mind. And deciding to bail to get out of an area is not a failure. It's not being a coward or being timid or anything like that. It really is all about being smart. It's about being wise. You can search the news at just about any point in time and you can find hikers who have gotten themselves in trouble. Speaking of which, in the last two days, there's been three rescues from the Virginia area. Hikers went out, they were not prepared, they ended up getting hurt, they slipped in the ice and snow. Each one had slightly different variations or circumstances to their trip as to why they had to get rescued. But in the end, they were out for adventures that they were not fully prepared for. They didn't have the right gear. Some were suffering from hypothermia. Some people had fallen, on and on and on. The thing is, you have to know when to go out. You have to know when to come in. And you have to be smart enough. And that's a, the biggest thing here. You have to be smart enough to know what conditions you can handle and what conditions you can't. Now everyone, let's talk about the gear that I used with this adventure. The three big items, Nature Hike 60 plus five backpack, the Nature Hike ultra light sleeping pad, and the Nature Hike Vic 2 tent. So the price of the backpack is 80 bucks. The sleeping pad was 50 bucks and the Vic 2 was 128 at the time of filming. In total, $258, which is very budget friendly for an outdoor trip. Let's talk about each component and my thoughts, starting with the sleeping pad. Nature Hike claims this is an ultralight sleeping pad. That's not true, not at all. It's over two pounds, it's like a brick in your hand, it's very heavy. Now, I was not comfortable on that pad at all. I inflated one side 100%. While it does offer quite a bit of cushion, the divides between each of those cushions was too much. So like on my side, my hips went right into the ground. So in the end, it wasn't that comfortable. Since this trip ended, I've been working with this pad and I reached out to Nature Hike to ask them, how is this pad supposed to be inflated? The pad features an interesting design. It's not unique, but it is interesting. It has two sides. So think of this, there's two sides and a divider in the middle and you can inflate one side or the other side. So if you get a hole on this side, you could still use this side to sleep on. It's an interesting design. It's not unique, as I've said before. Nature Hike states that you are meant to inflate each side, 50%, 50%. 
I did not do that. And that's because of my previous experience. With the previous double-sided sleeping pads that I've taken a look at, you're meant to inflate one side fully, as you were not able to inflate the other side with the other side also inflated. With both sides inflated, the pad is substantially more comfortable, but it is quite a bit more work to inflate both sides. Overall, the quality of the pad is pretty good. The price isn't bad super heavy and I will continue testing out this product and my review will be coming up in the future. Now let's talk about the Nature Hike Vic two-person tent. I wanted to confirm this. This is described as a four season backpacking tent. Can you use this in the fourth season? Yes, you can. Does that mean you should take this out to the highest mountain with a ton of snow and super strong winds? No, you shouldn't. For calmer weather, this is a tent that you can use. But the question is, do you want to use it? My issue with this tent was condensation. Yes, it was 100% waterproof. I had no issues with leaking, even with a ton of rain falling that night. The tent did not leak, but the condensation inside of that tent was just terrible. Some of the worst condensation buildup that I've ever seen. The tent might as well have leaked. It was so bad. As you all saw in the video, it was literally raining on me. Everything inside of the tent was just soaking wet. I had to take my sleeping bag and just cover up and spend numerous hours like that because it was raining so hard and knocking all of that moisture down on top of me. It was a huge mess, just unbelievably bad. Because of that, I would not recommend this tent for humid environments. Uh, this is a dry environment tent only, in my opinion. The ventilation, the condensation is just that bad. To be honest, I'm surprised at just how bad the condensation was. I knew it was going to be a problem, but I didn't expect anything like that. The fly doesn't go all the way down to the ground. You have the vents on the bottom and also the top. I did not expect it to be that awful, but it is some of the worst condensation I've ever seen in a tent. There is a version of this tent that has a snow fly. Do not get that. I mean, that would remove every bit of the ventilation minus the vents and oh my gosh, <laughs> it would be so much worse. I can't even imagine that. The version with the snow skirt, do not get it. If you're going to be out in a snowstorm that's blowing snow, use a different tent. Don't use that one. You will be sorry. The overall quality of that tent is not bad. Some of the stitching is pretty nasty, but the materials are good. The components are good. For $128, I've definitely seen worse in terms of quality, stitching, and so on. Something else to consider. The condensation was that terrible with one person. Imagine what it would have been like with two people. I can't imagine. I think there would have been a swimming pool of condensation on the ground. <laughs> I just can't imagine how bad it would have been. So the setup was easy. It was fairly lightweight. It was a good size for one person and their gear. Uh, you can sit up in it, change clothes. Ah, with the vents at the bottom, water did splash up into the tent. So in heavy, heavy rain, you have to keep that in mind. Make sure that your sleeping bag isn't too far down, which may be difficult if you're a taller person. Now switching gears over to the 60 plus five liter backpack. The overall quality of this pack is amazing for 80 bucks. The pack has a ton of features. And one feature that I didn't mention in the video is that it has a very robust frame sheet and also an internal frame. So you can throw your gear in this any way that you want to and you can wear it fairly comfortably. It does a good job of supporting that weight and being a load bearing system. With most ultralight backpacks of that design, they do not feature an internal frame or frame sheet. So you have to stack the gear in a certain way to really get it to form together with your back so that it's comfortable. The pack offers plenty of space for your gear, but it is a narrow pack, so you have to pack it tall. You have to pack it high. The hip pockets are insanely terrible. They're super small, super narrow. You might be able to get your phone in there, maybe not. I still have quite a bit of testing to do with this pack, namely without many layers on. I need to get this pack out, do some hiking with just a t-shirt to see how comfortable this shoulder harness is. As I pointed out in the video, the separation between the two harnesses is only like three and a half inches. So each of the harnesses really push into your neck here. It's highly uncomfortable, at least with the little bit of testing that I've done so far. Again, I will get this out, I will test it further, and we will see. But based upon what I've seen already, it is going to be uncomfortable with just a t-shirt. The torso length rating on this pack is right around 22 inches. So if you have a shorter torso length, 
this pack is not going to be a good fit for you, especially with that harness system. It will be difficult to get it to fit right. So that is something to keep in mind if you're interested in this pack. It does include a pack cover, which is nice. It worked very well. The pack stayed dry. The pack features two outer pockets, which work great with wet gear. That's where I put the tent and the inside of my pack and the contents stayed dry because the tent was not inside of the pack. Lastly, with the backpack, it does feature hydration ports, but there's no way to support a bladder. So it would have to lay down on top of your gear, which simply is not going to work in all situations. The sleeping bag that I had on this trip is from Enlightened Equipment, and that is the Convert. My review just went up. That bag is absolutely awesome. It's a custom made product. That means it's going to be expensive, but it's incredibly versatile. I love it. I really do. It is one of the best backpacking products that I've tested out in a long time. It has a full length zipper, so you can use it as a sleeping bag or a quilt. Make sure to check out my review of that. Next up, the chest rig that I was wearing was from Helicon Text. That is the Numbat. That is a fantastic piece of kit. Make sure to check out my review on that. Inside of that, I had a map paper map, I had a compass, I had my handgun, I had some camera equipment. People ask about the Numbat all the time. It is well worth the money. And also, it's very budget friendly actually. Most chest rigs are very expensive, not this one. To plan this trip, I used Gaia GPS and I used it on my phone. The folding chair that I had with this adventure was from Sportneer, and that is a good piece of equipment. Over the years, I've really grown to appreciate having a folding chair with me. Yes, they are a little bit heavy, but it is so nice to be able to sit down next to the fire you don't have to worry about sitting on wet logs or hurting your knees or anything like that. Yeah, that's a nice piece of kit. If you're interested in my review of the Sport Near Folding Chair, check out the channel. The knife is the Ika, EKA Nordic W12. I reviewed this in the past. It's a good general purpose knife. It's a master of nothing, but it's good at everything. It comes fairly sharp out of the box, but I honed an edge on that. That thing, phew, it is scary sharp. <laughs> it really is. We'll go through this a little bit quicker. The stove was the MSR Pocket Rocket Deluxe. That is the winter cold weather version. Works very well. The pants that I was wearing, Fjall Raven Vita Pros with the side zipper. Excellent pair of pants. I will have a video dedicated to those coming up very soon. The t-shirts that I like to wear are from Old Navy. The fleece is a USGI Polar Tech fleece. The jacket was an Arterix jacket. I'm not sure what the model is because I got this off of eBay. It is something that's been discontinued. Arterix, they make high-end gear that's very expensive, but if you purchase on eBay, you can find this stuff oftentimes used very inexpensively, and that's what I did. Buy used, save a lot of money. When it comes to my rain gear, the jacket was the Marmot Minimalist, and the pants were from Snug Pack. The meals that I had with this adventure were from Real Termat, and they were fantastic. They really were. The reindeer stew is one of the best meals out there. The meat soup was also very good. Very similar to the reindeer stew, but just a little bit different. Both I highly recommend if you can get them. Getting them imported into the country is not easy and they're not cheap. Someone recently sent me an email and said that it would cost over $30 per meal to get those into the country. So yeah, unfortunately, finding them is going to be hard. Luckily, I had some viewers send me tons and tons of them. Thank you guys so much. I appreciate it big time. I really do. For the most part, folks, we've gone over the gear. We've gone over the trip. Let's just talk about some minor things that you all didn't get to see or hear, I guess. Now, let's see. You all did get to hear the bobcat. When I got into the tent, I was basically getting ready for the night. I started hearing something and it sounded like somebody was talking. That concerned me. I was so far out in the middle of nowhere. If I heard talking, hmm, I would be on edge. So I stopped, listened. It was just a bobcat screaming in the woods. <laughs> in addition to the bobcats, there were owls hooting all night, <laughs> which was incredibly pleasant, right? I love laying in the tent. I was reading my book and just listening to the owls. And that's so incredibly special. I just love it. What I like about being in remote areas is that when you hear one owl, oftentimes you will hear another. So it's like you hear the singing over here and the singing over there or calling or whatever you want to call it. But yeah, hearing about the owls and the bobcat, that was very cool. So let's see here, folks, what else is there to talk about? With this section of the Pisgah National Forest, my time down there exploring is just about over. For one thing, I've explored most of the area. I pretty much know it like the back of my hand now. I know where the trails go. I know how to interconnect all of the different campsites up there and also, it is almost time for the rattlesnakes and the copperheads to come out. 
That area has a lot of both. There are some huge timber rattlesnakes down that direction, and also a lot of copperheads. Because of those two venomous snakes, I like to explore those areas when it's colder, and stay up in the mountains when it's hotter. Yes, you can hike around with snake gators on, they do work, but if you've never done that, it's not something that you really want to do, especially in hot weather. They could be absolutely miserable. Yes, they are an option. I have viewers who ask about them from time to time, but the thing is, you don't really want to hike in those things. With the Pisgah National Forest, it's huge. It's roughly 500,000 acres, and it spans a huge area. So there's many places to explore. You all will continue to see the Pisgah National Forest in future episodes. And who knows, I may go down there into that area and do more truck camping into the future. But for now, I'm done down there. I'm ready to explore some new areas. And everyone, that pretty much wraps it up for this trip. There wasn't a whole lot to talk about that you all did not get to see. I can't talk about the camera that I was using to film the episode with. It did a good job for the most part. Um, in the end, when it comes to filming for run and gun sort of stuff, Nothing beats a Sony, in my opinion. The image quality is very good. The colors are, they're good. They're not super great, but you can fix that. The autofocus is the absolute best on the market. So if you want to set up a camera and let the camera just do its thing while tracking and doing everything properly, Sony's the way to go. Canon is very good, but it's not that good. But anyways, that's getting off subject just a little bit, but I love talking about cameras. If you have any questions that I did not address in this episode, feel free to shoot me an email. Everybody else, make sure to comment down below, share your thoughts about this episode and also about that trip. I'll be honest, when I walked up on that campsite and all of that garbage there, I was so pissed. I was just angry. That sort of stuff really gets on my nerves. It really makes me mad. It's unfortunate because it's not only that campsite, it's all of the campsites. Every single campsite in the area, there's trees that have been chopped down, not to burn, just chopped down for the hell of it. There's trash everywhere. Beer bottles, beer cans, everywhere. Anyways, everyone, take care. Strength and honor. On to the next episode. I wish you all well. Bye, folks. <laughs>